Hello, uh, my name is Darren Woodruff and I am the co-project director for the National Center on Response to Intervention or RTI and I'm very pleased uh, today to be presenting with a colleague of mine who I'll introduce in a moment on the subject of RTI and family engagement. Um, now the role of parents and families in RTI implementation is often discuss sometimes in passing, sometimes in detail, but this is one of the critical areas that uh, we feel more attention needs to be paid to by uh, schools and educators and researchers and others in order to make sure um, RTI implementation, whether it's at the building or district or state level, is done with as much fidelity um, and effectively as possible. So with no further ado, I'd like to introduce um, one of the RTI Center's advisory board members, uh, Deborah Jennings, who will tell us a little bit about herself and the uh, Parent Technical Assistance Centers, which she works with. Deborah? Thank you, Darren. This is Deborah Jennings from the Region 1 Parent Technical Assistance Center, located at the Statewide Parent Advocacy Network in New Jersey, where I am the co-director for a project that help parent training and information centers and community parent resource centers to be more effective in their work and efforts to serve families of children with disabilities ages birth to 26. Our role as a parent technical assistance center is done in collaboration with technical assistance providers like the National Center on RTI where we work with them to develop and disseminate many of the products that they have um, put together in their centers around information on research-based practices um, in the field, including working with SEAs, parent organizations, professional associations, disability groups, and other child-serving agencies. Now, the parent centers, if we go to the next slide, um, just to know a little bit about them, there are 106 parent centers serving families across our nation. And the focus of the parent centers is really helping families to understand special education and general education laws and the evidence-based practices that are important to improving outcomes for children with disabilities. Their work is one-on-one -on -one with families. They also participate in planning and decision-making around the kinds of supports and services that are needed at the systems level in early intervention, education, and transition to adult life. Parent centers are great partners for state education agencies, for state lead agencies, for Part C, as well as other organizations who are really looking to provide the important services that are needed for children with disabilities. So going to the presentation overview, there are just a couple of things that we would really hope we can accomplish in this presentation. Uh, the first is just to give a really very quick overview of the research around parent and family engagement and how important it is to the improving the outcomes for children and particularly children with disabilities. And the other reason that we're doing this is to really help you to really think about the strategies that you can be using in order to intentionally engage families in the implementation, the scaling up, and in sustaining your response to intervention efforts. And then finally, it's to really promote for you and to you the importance of collaborating with the OSEP-funded parent centers who are really experts on how to address family engagement. Thanks, Deborah. Now, I know there's been, over the years, a good amount of research that's been done on the importance and the role of family engagement, family and parent engagement in schools. Can you walk us through some of the more uh, important reports or research that's been done in this area? Sure, I can. I, I would say that um, one of the best 
studies was done a number of years ago. It's a, a meta-analysis of a number of studies around family engagement, and it's called A New Wave of Evidence, The Impact of School, Family, and Community Connections on Student Achievement. And you can find that resource right on the web at the website for um, sedlfetal.org. Uh, it's a study by Ann Henderson and Karen Knapp. And what they, what they find is that family engagement is one of the most important factors in determining the success of students. It's across socioeconomic status, across language, across uh, race and ethnicity, with and without disability, engaging families is important in helping students to be uh, successful. The impact on attendance, the impact on homework, as well as um, the impact in terms of how uh, teachers are respond in terms of their efficacy and the great benefits for teachers when families are engaged, and also the great benefit for schools when families are engaged as uh, supporters, as partners, and also as critical friends in schools and helping schools to make really good decisions about their improvement efforts. Um, the, the work that was done by Henderson and Mapp has actually been essentially translated into a, an excellent reference called Beyond the Bake Sale, which is a guide to effective family school partnerships and includes really very um, excellent information in terms of ways to gather information about how well or um, how poorly a school is doing in terms of engaging families, how to make sure that that work is focused on supporting student success in school, and also it includes uh, a number of um, surveys and a number of ideas of ways that you can implement the kinds of strategies that are particular to the needs of your school community. Um, another reference that is really related to particularly the needs of youth who are transitioning from school to adult life was done by the Journal of Disability Policy Studies. And in that study, it, it's such an important focus on how families support young people to be self-advocates and to help young people in understanding what their strengths and also their needs are as they move into adult life and how they can be advocates for accessing those needs and the resources to support them. And a final resource that we've included here for our listeners um, is an updated um, version of a, of a resource that was previously published. It's called the ABCs of RTI, Essential Components of Elementary and Middle School RTI, a Guide for Parents. And it's, it's produced by the National Center on RTI, and it should be available um, very soon. It says coming soon there on the slide. And it looks at um, the role of parents or I, I, what the ideal role of parents are in schools, both at the elementary and middle school level that are implementing RTI. So there, there's a rich body um, of research on, on, this, on this issue. And I see we have a, a quote here, Deborah. Yes, I, I, I don't think that we can emphasize it enough how important involving the community and parents in the education of children is and how it's so critical for the successful implementation of any intervention, uh, particularly interventions that are associated with closing those achievement gaps that just seem to be so difficult for us to address, and also increasing graduation rates, which is a really very important focus today as we work to make sure that students are college and career ready. On the next slide, um, it goes on to talk about, however, unless parents and communities are involved in education in ways that are deliberately planned as well as connected to a school's and district's academic goals, 
these efforts are often producing results that are not what we are looking for. And this comes out of work that was done by the California Action Team in 2009 where there was a, a team of individuals, of organizations from across the state representing all of the community and school stakeholders who really did some very intentional work around what is it that needs to happen in schools, what guidance can we give to schools in order for schools to more effectively engage families and community in improving academics in our schools and making sure that there is that really strong connection between family engagement and results for students. I, I really like the emphasis there on a, a deliberate planning of how the parents and families and community members are going to be connected to the work going on in the school and their academic goals because we often we often hear that that is important but it's not always um, specifically thought through and planned and made an integral part of what happens and I think we as researchers it's easy to um, or even as practitioners to forget how important that is and and we may not see the impact or the success with our students that we want without that parental involvement piece. Um, and so moving on to the next slide, we actually have put together here a construct um, for considering intentional parent and family involvement um, within the RTI framework. And it looks like moving forward, we have six different categories or types of parent involvement. So I'm going to ask Deborah to, to, to walk us across those six categories of parent involvement. And so when we're looking at parent involvement, um, I think it's important for us to not look at parent involvement through just one lens. There are so many different ways that parents can be involved in schools and involved in districts, and those are not really limited as far as often is the case appearing for meetings or for um, cultural events or for um, other kinds of workshops because, you know, too often parent involvement is measured based on attendance sheets. And true and authentic parent involvement recognizes that there are a lot of different ways that parents can be involved and ways that parents will be involved when they're given the opportunities that align with what they see as their um, strengths and also in, that are aligned with what they have in terms of their availability and their interests and their needs. So Joyce Epstein, who is with the School Family and Community Partnership, which is out of John Hopkins University, developed this framework for six types of parent involvement. And this framework has actually been translated and into use by the National PTA and is the formula for the National PTA's um, standards for parent involvement. So the, the six types are uh, focused on first what it means in terms of learning at home. And um, well, let me, let me start with parenting. And I always call it parenting plus because the word parenting, when you are a parent, uh, tends to make you feel as if there's something that you are really not doing right, that there's, uh, there are things that are not really happening in your family, and so you need help around parenting. So I use the, the term parenting, and, and now because you know families are so different in terms of the ways that they're made up and how... Um, inclusive they are in terms of members of the extended family or members of the community, it's also about caregiving. And so when we're looking at parenting, we want to consider ways that we can assist families with having the kinds of skills that they need. We can assist families in terms of uh, family support and understanding their child and adolescent development and also about how to set up the kinds of home conditions that are supportive to learning. And that, you know, depending on a child's age or grade level, those may be different. Um, so looking at the different requirements 
of parenting and how those change as students uh, move along in school. Um, you also want to assist the schools in understanding family backgrounds and cultures and how families establish their goals for children. And it's important to consider this because um, many of the individuals who are in professional positions are not necessarily from the same backgrounds or cultures of the uh, families. And so really looking at our own culture as a, as a school or a district, looking at our personal culture as the, the teacher or the principal, and then considering how that um, may influence our view of families and how we need to better align our view of our own culture with that of the families that we're working with. Another area is how parents can volunteer in the school and how we can involve parents um, in different ways and how that requires that we're looking at how we recruit families as volunteers, how we train them, what are the activities that we determine in, co in collaboration with families that are going to accommodate the needs and interests of the diverse families and how we, we set up schedules for that. It also means that we enable educators to be able to work with volunteers and to be able to think about ways that they can work together with families in order to support students um, in the school. Now, learning at home um, is another area. And this is how do we involve families in their child's academics and how they can, in the home, implement different kinds of activities that actually are supporting the work that's going on in school. Um, it's through how are we supporting families around things like homework, um, having family literacy activities or projects that are, that are completed at between home and school, and how we help families to understand the curriculum and how the curriculum can be connected to home-related activities. Also, when we're talking about learning at home, it's about encouraging educators to design homework that really enables students to be able to share and discuss what they're learning in school so that their families are feeling much more connected to what's happening and can better understand ways that they can help and support their child. Communication is uh, the next type of parent involvement. And that is about how do we, um, how are we communicating with families? How, what does the communication look like? Is that community, uh, that communication a two-way communication? Is it through various types of channels? How are we using our um, email systems and how are we using websites? How are we sharing information in terms of calendars and flyers and, and newsletters? And what are the ways that families can communicate information to the school? to the teacher about their individual child, or in the case of implementing response to intervention, about how they're experiencing that implementation and how they are, you know, whether or not they feel as if it is being implemented in the way that it is designed and with fidelity. And then the sixth area is around decision making. And it, it's really about how do we include families as participants in school decisions. When we're implementing um, the components of response to intervention, where is the role for families in terms of learning about what the components are that are being implemented? and actually having an opportunity to have a conversation in terms of what their thinking is around, around those components. And that's from the very beginning um, and then throughout the implementation. Um, 
it's about giving parents really meaningful roles and helping them to participate in school change or school improvement processes by providing the kind of training and information that is needed in order to be um, really effective in those roles. Um, it's also about how do we enable educators and administrators with the skills that are needed in order to have that partnership and to be consensus builders and, and to be collaborators. And so uh, thinking about that, the area of decision making, how do we learn how to distribute leadership and share that decision making and the power of the decision making? So moving to the next slide under this category of parent and family engagement um, and how it applies to response to intervention. But I really like um, in particular how your notion of parenting plus, when we think about that in the context of RTI, how the emphasis there is on making sure as, as schools, as educators, we design activities that can help families understand RTI, um, how it connects to their child or their students learning, um, helping parents acquire parenting skills that are development, developmentally appropriate for where their child is, and then also to set the home conditions to support that student's learning and, and helps finally help schools uh, obtain more richer information about student strengths, their interests, and their challenges. And I think that that, can, that whole construct that you just gave us an overview of can really be applied um, to the RTI model if we go to the next slide, we'll see that we have the um, essential RTI components there. So when you think about things like student screening and student progress monitoring, these are critical components of RTI, but these are certainly areas where it's important to make sure the parent is aware that their child is being screened, what the results of that type of an assessment is, um, as progress monitoring throughout the school year continues where their child is and also learning about what the strengths and interest of that child is so that the database decision making that results um, can be as informed by a real knowledge of the student as possible. And also if you look at our, um, our, our components here, the inner circle includes cultural responsiveness and with the diversity we have in many of our schools there's no way that the school can be responsive to every culture or every ethnicity or race that comes through the door without having that kind of strong connection and interaction um, from the parents and from family members and community members as well. And all of that folds into the uh, ultimate goal of RTI, which really is to be a, a multi-level prevention system to prevent um, lear either learning or behavioral challenges. So. Um, it's not always looked upon in that way, but it's, it's very clear through how you described it that the, the parent role is critically important to making sure we can, we can approach all of these components with integrity. And so if we move on to the next slide, we see with the multiple levels or multiple tiers of prevention and intervention, whether it's at the primary or core curriculum level, or once you start identifying students with any learning or behavioral challenges and you apply the secondary or tertiary tiers of prevention or intervention, these are all areas where it's critically important to make sure the parent is aware of where their child is, what interventions or prevention strategies are being utilized, and, and what the results of those activities are. So there's, there's really the strong need for a two-way communication between the uh, school and the parents. So Deborah, we see with the RTI framework that we have these uh, multiple levels of prevention going from the primary or core curriculum to secondary to tertiary as we go up the tiers. How do you see the uh, role of parent or family involvement being different as we, as we move up and down these tiers? I think that's a very good question, Darren. When we're looking at parent involvement and RTI with real intentionality, we're looking at what are the requirements in terms of each of these types of parent involvement based on 
what's happening with children on, at each of the tiers. So let's look at, why don't we look at communication? If we talk about communication at the primary intervention level, every school, every district should have some really sort of kinds of core kinds of communication to all families. That newsletter that announces upcoming events, the brochures and fact sheets on the various kinds of programs that are available, the information that is shared about changes in curriculum or uh, changes in terms of the, um, the types of, um, in terms of what's happening in the school schedules and staff, et cetera. And so every school is, is going to have some kind of core information. Um, many of the schools that I visit have websites where every parent can go on a web-based portal and log in and find out how is my child doing? Is the homework in? Did they take that test? How well did they do on the test? And how are they progressing in terms of their instruction? Now, when a student is in need of greater levels of intervention, it, there is also a need for greater levels of communication and greater communication with the family. So if we're, if we're looking at, say, student progress monitoring, how, as a school, are we sharing information with the family about how the student is doing every time their progress is monitored? How are students doing on those particular assessments, whether they're curriculum-based assessments or if they're um, standardized uh, benchmark assessments? How are students doing? What does this mean? And is the project, is the progress as is expected? Is it at a trajectory that is going to move the student to where the student needs to be by a certain time so that the student will no longer need that intervention or that intervention becomes just part of their, their regular um, instructional program? So that's a really um, very much more specific and intense type of communication, very individualized to the student and his family. Now, when the student moves to higher tiers, then there's some information that is required to be communicated with families uh, based on local or state um, codes and laws, as well as there's information that may be required under IDEA. So if, a, if it seems as if the student isn't progressing sufficiently in the other tiers and it looks like we need to just make some decisions about whether or not the student may be eligible for special education services, there's some really very definitive information that has to be shared with families, um, including um, the requirements around meetings, the requirements around uh, evaluations, how are we sharing evaluations with families, how are we helping families to uh, decipher what those evaluation means and how are we supporting families in uh, their role as decision makers as part of a, um, as part of an IEP team or even at, um, in those other levels as part of a um, system of support team. So communication is probably one of the best examples about how the intensity of that communication increases along with the intensity of the intervention. And uh, moving on to our next slide, I, I see we have a handy grid that I think would be useful to schools that are actively implementing response to intervention because it breaks each of the critical components of RTI down into categories all the way through the potential identification of students as having a disability. And each of the steps that we've talked about in terms of family engagement in the school um, are included here. So I, I think it would, be, it would be wise and useful for schools to use something like this to document and capture all the different ways they are, are working to make sure parents and family members are included um, in all, all the different aspects 
of RTI. I agree, Darren, and I would start first with looking at what what are we doing in, in our school in terms of parent involvement? And how are those parent involvement activities connected to what we are trying to do, particularly as it relates to response to intervention? But really what it is that we're trying to do as it relates to our improving the achievement and the success of our students. Because as we talked about earlier, there are some activities that are happening around parent involvement that really are not connected to our desired results. And so when we're looking at each of our family engagement activities, we really, first of all, we don't have a lot of resources for family engagement. So we really need to use what we have in order to achieve the results for students that we would like to have. So if we're having a family math night, how is the family math night connected to this chart? Well, family math night would definitely be considered to be a learning at home type of parent involvement activity because this is a, an event that will help parents to understand more about the math that's being taught in our school. But we want to also ask the question, is that family math night, are those activities really connected to Tier 1, which is high quality core instruction in a research-based curriculum. So as we're designing our family math night, we're looking at our IP, RTI implementation. We're not just having family math night so that we can say we had family math night, 100 families showed up, and they had a really great time, and it helped us to build uh, camaraderie and, and improve our school climate. I'm the, I am the last person that would say school climate is not important, but you can actually build school climate at the same time that you are helping families to be really engaged in ways that achieve desired results. Great. So moving forward, are there some examples that we can share with our listening audience on um, effective strategies for making sure we include parents and family members? There are a lot of ways that we can engage families. And for each of them, we really want to think about how do those fit into our construct for RTI and family engagement. I have um, shared with you different types of strategies based on the type of uh, family involvement. So for each type, we shared about a half a dozen, um, four to six strategies that you might want to consider based on the students in your school, based on where you are in terms of implementation of response to intervention. And it should always be tailored to your school community because things that work in some schools are not necessarily going to be really targeted to addressing the needs. So if we look at um, type one, which is that parenting plus, um, where we want to help families to establish that home environment that support children as students, there's some things that we might want to think about in terms of how do we help parents to be more effective in their role. In some of our communities, parents may need education themselves. They may need help in terms of, of achieving a GED. They may need help in terms of literacy so that they can support families, uh, support their students in literacy activities around home. Um, sometimes we are working with families who, are, who need basic information and support around the need, their needs in terms of health, nutrition, and other kinds of support services. It's also a, an activity, a really important activity to go out to the community and to really meet with families in the neighborhood and that way it helps the family to understand the school and also helps the school to understand families. I go into a lot of schools and one of the challenges is around student mobility and often that mobility may be around there being a 
number of multifamily structures. Um, sometimes the rents are being changed and families can't afford it anymore. So families move in, families move out. Actually meeting some of the families at that neighborhood building may be a way to help understand what families need in order to help them to um, be able to have at least a stable environment when they're at school. Some activities around the next type, communication you know, conferences. And when we're talking about the RTI process, it really requires a lot more sharing of information with families because we have more information about students when we're implementing RTI. We have all of that um, assessment results and student progress data. Why not share it with families? There's a school in New Jersey that I worked with that has been really very successful because one of the things that they do is at the beginning of the year when they do their universal screening, at that first meeting with every parent, they talk about those universal screening results and they say, this is where your child is right now. And this is where your child needs to be by April or May of the school year. This tells them about the different activities around, say, reading that are going to happen in school, and then tells them these are the ways that you can be a partner with us at home. Now, if your child isn't progressing at that trajectory, we're going to let you know, and we're going to provide some additional interventions for your child in order to get to that trajectory. I think in RTI, too often parents are surprised when they get information that their child is receiving an intervention. But if everybody has that conference at the beginning of the year and talks about what that universal screening means and what it means when student progress isn't as projected, how that will change, you won't have as many surprises coming from parents who are not happy because they basically did not have a clue or understanding about what was going to happen in terms of their um, child in this RTI system. And I think that that's critically important for making sure that the use of RTI as a school improvement or student support framework in the first place is embraced and understood as a real benefit and asset for students. So I, I think that's a very important point. With um, type 3, which is volunteers where parents are resources, when you're um, implementing an RTI system, it really helps to have some other hands on deck in the school, if possible, in the classroom that are helping to keep things organized, that are providing resources and information for other parents that can help with students while other professionals are working with some students who need more intense work. There's a group in one of the districts here in New Jersey where parents are trained to just sort of do reading along with small groups of students while the teacher is working intensively with other groups of students. And it's another way to help teachers feel as if they have the resources that they need in order to really implement um, RTI with fidelity. Because as we know, one of the biggest challenges with any kind of change is that there's always a sense of, well, you're just adding that one more thing to the other hundred things that I feel like I have to do. When you have parents in the school as resources, it can help teachers to feel less pressure in terms of having that one more thing to do. With learning at home, it is so important, and you know, especially now as we're moving into, in many states, the, the um, implementation of the Common Core state standards or the, the National Common Core standards, it's so important for families to know what is in there. You know, what is it that you want my child to know and be able to do in, as they're moving from grade to grade, as they're moving throughout the school year? And how can I help my child in order to be able to, uh, to improve their skills and achieve those standards. So these next two slides on learning at home are just some ideas on the kinds of information that it's important to share with families in order to assist them in that role of learning at home. On um, the next 
slide, it talks about decision making. And it, it is, I know, frankly, one of the most difficult areas for many schools and districts in which to feel comfortable, I'll, I'll, I'll say. Because it really means that you are inviting families into those places where sometimes we're not really sure how families are going to react when they, you know, sort of look deeper into what is happening in the classroom. I know the first time that I ever heard about RTI as a parent, and there was the discussion about, well, we, you know, we're monitoring students to see how they're doing. If they're not doing well, then we're implementing interventions. My first reaction, and I believe many parents' first reaction would be, well, that's what we thought was really happening in our, in our students' classes for, for all of these years. So sometimes parents are surprised at what is or what may not be happening in their child's school. But to the extent that we are not only inviting parents in as partners and also as critical friends, to the extent we're not only inviting them, but also we are providing the kind of information and training that helps them to understand how to really be effective in those roles as partners and co-decision makers, the better the outcome is going to be for everyone. I know that many schools and districts are struggling with how do we maintain our response to intervention implementation when the principal changes, when superintendents are changing, when school board members are changing. Well, by including your most important partners, who are the parents of the children who are benefiting in the discussions about how it's working, especially about how well it's working, and what that information looks like, and how the change is really helping students, and really understanding what it is, and what it takes to continue to implement it, parents will be the number one champions and advocates for continuing the change and continuing the progress versus moving to the next new thing and never really being able to realize what we're investing in terms of our efforts around RTI. So those next couple of slides um, give you some ideas on, on really effective ways for engaging parents as decision makers. And then in the last area, we talk about collaborating with the community. And again, when we talk about resources and education, I don't know about in other states, but in the state of New Jersey, the discussion about resources is, is primarily about how do we reduce and or eliminate resources because of the economic conditions, because of growing budgets that we now need to find a way in to make our schools more effective. Well, one of the ways to do that is through partnering with other kinds of resources and services that are in the community. And in most places, it's the families who know who are the community agencies, who are the other organizations, who have programs that can help to support the families in the school. And so, you know, as we're looking at the more intensive interventions, and particularly sometimes when we're looking at the behavioral interventions, it's often community resources that are going to help us to provide the kind of interventions that are needed for families. And you know, really looking at what's out there in the community and how can we partner in order to have those resources work for our kids. So we have a couple of slides of different ways that you can look at collaborating with the community. Thank you, Deborah. I think what's really valuable about this, your presentation today is that it's reinforcing the idea that there's many different ways for parents to be engaged and um, involved in what's going on at the school and with their with their children, with their students, and it's. It's, um, I guess, like, that, like the research says, it's beyond the bake sale. 
And we certainly talked about parenting, parenting plus, as you put it, but there's also learning at home, there's also communication, there's also volunteering, there's involvement of parents and family members in the decision-making process, and that's particularly important with RTI, and then there's also just general collaboration with the school. So I, I think what's valuable about, about today's conversation is that these are areas that schools can be a lot more strategic about making sure that they are focused on as they, as they implement their RTI framework. So we're going to end with this final slide, which lists um, a number of national and regional resources that parents, researchers, educators, and others can utilize to get even more information on effective strategies for parent and family engagement. And you'll see there starting with the Parent Center Network and going all the way through um, our own national center on RTI. So I, I think the point that I'm taking from this is that we can be just as strategic and intentional with how we involve parents and family members as we are about all of the other components of um, RTI and strong interventions and, and supports for students. So I want to end by thanking um, Deborah Jennings, who is the co-director of the Region 1 Parent Technical Assistance Center and also has served for a number of years on the advisory board for the National Center on RTI. Um, thank you so much, Deborah, for contributing to this webinar. Thank you so much, Darren, for inviting me to share this way for schools and for educators and for districts to, to really think and rethink about how to effectively engage families in order to support implementation of RTI and, and really in order to improve the results for kids.